Okay, so we we got you at Fort Campbell, but you're ready. You're ready to move on out of there, aren't yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah. So my wife. So I came down on orders because I was airborne qualified to go to Fort Bragg, which I was real excited for. I started reading all the books about it. Uh, started asking guys in the platoon, like who's been to Bragg or who's been to North Carolina, and one of the guys in my platoon, he was like, "Hey, bro, you're going." Nice lush mountains. You got the Appalachian Trail. You got wake up in the morning. You look across the valley, and there's fog and the trees. It's really picturesque. I was like, dang. And then, but in Bragg, yeah. Fort Bragg. <laughs> so, so hold on, hold on, hold on. I've I've been yeah. there. I've been there. <laughs> so here we are. We're driving. Like we 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 leave Clarksville, Tennessee. Start heading mm-hmm. east. We get to uh, we break that Tennessee north. Carolina line and we're going up to Asheville and like he said it was beautiful and I was mm-hmm. like wow this is I understand now why guys stay because you hear about guys going to brag and never leave and I understand uh-huh. why now and so we were we're rolling up into uh but I'm like looking at the car map we we stop off in um in uh Asheville and I'm looking at the car map I'm like man we still got quite a distance to go and I don't like <laughs> Well, I hope it looks the same there as it does here. And my wife is like, she grew up in Germany, and she's like, wow, this does remind me of Germany. Like, yeah, I mean, if Germany is this nice, I would never turn down an assignment there. So Mm -hmm. we hop back in the cars, and we're heading. And now she's reminding me, she's like seven, eight months pregnant. We really don't have a place to stay once we get there. We roll. So So where Asheville is is considered high country. Right, well, I didn't, we didn't know that then. Fayetteville is considered low country, and the terrain, the topography oh, yeah. is totally different. The the feeling, the atmosphere is totally different. So we roll down, we get to, we get we roll into Fayetteville, and I, I'm just like, uh, what happened? Yeah. I'm like, son of a bitch! Like I, it was like everything was under construction, and I was like, oh, it's gonna get better. I roll into my, like, we get to the hotel. They put us in officer quarters because my wife is pregnant. And so I got to live for about a month. And while we find a place to stay, we bought our first house, moved in on Halloween of 2000. And then uh, we stayed in that house for about eight years. It was our first home that we bought. I was proud. It was like my, I was young and I was watching too much home improvement and I was just doing projects after projects around the house. Uh, but I was, in a, so I report to my unit. My unit was great. I'm a new sergeant in the unit. The 82nd was a great experience that I would, I wouldn't do over again for anything. It, it was a different time period. You know, it was a boys club at the time. They had just stopped. They had just gotten rid. The year I got there was the year they closed down the, topless burger joint on post because they just started i never got to go there (laughs) but they had a they had a that they had supposedly they had a you hear all these rumors when you're a young soldier they had a topless burger joint that that you can go and get a beer and see some boobs a year prior to me getting there because they just integrated females into the airborne unit so of course they have to get rid of it um there is. Uh, there was a lot of changes. There was no more of the hazing that supposedly went on. I'm not really sure. I was. I, I only hear. I already heard rumors of things of what life was like prior to that. Right. Um, so we ended up. Uh, I really. I, I. I can't say I hated it, but it wasn't my my favorite place. And so this is 2000. 2001 is approaching, mm-hmm. and. Life is starting to pick up. I'm starting to get more responsibilities at work. My little, my little uh, daughter is just. She was born in uh, that that Christmas uh, of 2000. She just, she was just born, and uh, life was good. I had my routine, and then that all kind of came crashing down on September 11th. Yeah, I'm looking at. So we had just finished doing PT, and we walk inside the the barracks, and we're and I was in one of my soldiers' rooms, and we were shining in our boots. I, I think, I think it was a Monday. I, if I remember right, it might have been a Monday. So I was 
polishing my boots like I would normally do, watching the news, and we were talking crap to each other. He turned on Fox News, and we kind of just froze there. We we looked at the screen. We saw the uh, the smoke billowing, um, billowing out of the tower, and I was like, you know what? I wonder if if uh, what was that? Uh, you remember in 1999 when everybody had that glitch Y2K? When Y2K, yeah. like I thought yeah. it was a, I actually thought Y2K, it was a Y2K glitch that caused the aircraft to hit the building. Mm-hmm. And then we sat there and watched a second plane hit, and that, and we were on DRF one. That's uh, so every division has a unit, a brigade with all its support elements ready to go to deploy within 18 hours. Every brigade in the mm-hmm. army or every uh, major installation has this unit. And it was our turn to do it. And I was like, holy crap, we got to get ready. And, and, and mm-hmm. next thing you know, we have this, um, we have this uh, formation. The commander's like, all right, hey, we're going to go sit at Green Rap and wait for the call. So that's what we did. We packed up our stuff. If you have any last minute things, we're not going to go until tomorrow. So that was September mm-hmm. 11th. We weren't going to be there until the 12th. So mm-hmm. I went home, grabbed, there was like a really minor thing. I forgot it. I think I might've forgotten like my dog tags or something. So I drive home, which is like 18 minutes out from door to door. And I'm driving back in traffic. And I don't know if you remember Bragg back in 2000, if you were there. There was traffic backed up. You can just drive on post. There was no gates or anything. All American just went right into it. Well, they blocked it off. And they blocked the Yakin gate off. And they blocked all the the gates that you can get on post off. And there was traffic backed up. I stayed on. It took me 18 hours to get on Whoa. Yeah. Sitting in your car? Yeah. I was like, stop and go, stop and go. Because they were they were doing a full they were they were checking everything except your your colon to get on post. Wow. Uh, and so we we went up so it was like car by car. They only went down to one lane. And I fell asleep in my car listening to Sean Hannity and Russ Limbaugh. That's- and all you know, by the time it was uh I forget the name of the uh, of the show is like three o'clock in the morning. I pull back on post. Oh my and, gosh! Um, that if you fell asleep during those two guys because they weren't quiet individuals, you must have really been fatigued. Yeah, and so I get I finally get back on post. We ended up uh, sitting on green ramp for like three days, and that's like a a terminal where all the parachute like they have these specially designed wooden benches for paratroopers to put on all their gear and kind of wait around until mm-hmm. they, hurry up and wait. That's basically what ended up happening. Uh, yeah. Three day hurry up and wait operation. Well, uh, they say we're not going to be, uh, we're going to be on standby to go to New York. So we turned in our parachutes, jumped on the bus and uh, headed back to the unit. And by the time we got back to the unit, they said, you know, Hey, take a four day, uh, be, be ready to, deploy any, to anywhere in the world. So for four days, I sat there. My wife didn't have any clue during those three days what was going on because we were a blackout, a communication blackout. Mm-hmm. Uh, so before I, we took off that day, we had to go back to the motor pool. We we're putting all our gear away, getting it ready, doing inspections. And uh, we hear the C-17s. This this is about noon time. We heard the C- it, because there was no air traffic in the area for those right. for like a week. And you hear the, uh, finally you heard the C 17s engines roar up because it was, you know how quiet it gets during the nighttime because everybody is asleep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's how quiet it was at Bragg that day. There was no cars on the road. It was just our unit out. All the units that were part of the DRF package putting their stuff away. And so when those engines turned on at Pope Army Airfield, which is a good five miles as a crow's cry, you can hear mm-hmm. those engines rev up. 
And the next thing you wow. know, man, you hear that, you see that, you see three C-17s, I believe it was three, take off, and they were heading south, in whatever direction they were heading. And um, I looked at my platoon sergeant. It's like, who do you suppose are on those birds? He didn't have a clue, but he says it's probably the SF dudes. And that's when I was like, the who? The Special Forces guys. And I started scratching my I've, I I wanted to go to selection before. And I was like, mm -hmm. now I really wanted to go. I was like, this is it. This is my time. This is my moment. This is what I need to do. So after we were done that day, I, I pulled him aside and I was like, hey, I want to go to selection. And the 82nd has this thing that the moment you say you want to go to special forces selection and assessment, assessment and selection, they say, if you go, don't come back. And I don't know what they, I really didn't know. I thought I, I took it to mean if you, if, if you go, you're not welcome. I took it to mean as if you didn't go, you're not welcome back here. Mm -hmm. But what he was really saying was if you go, make sure you can get selected. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So he then told me his story that he had gone through. He got selected, went through the Q course. It was affecting his marriage. And so he got out, you know, he was like, I'll just, I want to, I want to be married to the girl who's going to eventually divorce me and take care, take, take everything I have and accuse me of a, a lot of awful things for something I really want to do. And that's what happened. He said he gave, he put his family first and she was an awful person and she mm. ended up coming to find out she was, uh, he would come to work with black eyes and say he got into a bar oh. and say he got into a bar fight because he wouldn't hit his wife and she would just full on deck. Him. And I saw his wife, his wife was like this really petite woman, like, but no, she was like full on, like beating the snot out of MMA. Yeah, beating the brakes off of my platoon, sorry. So, but I didn't find out about that until years later. Because mm -hmm. he, he asked me to be a witness to coming in with black eyes and stuff like that. Right. You always say you got into a bar fight or whatever. You know, like, hey, cool, you know. Um, but, um, so yeah, so I got selected. I went through selection on uh, November, December. It was <clears throat> October, November, or maybe it was... November, December, 2001, mm -hmm. the, the second selection class after 9-11. And, um, uh, I started the Q course. Um, I found out early I was going to be speaking French. So to be a special forces soldier, you have to speak another language. And so I was told I was going to be speaking French, which meant I was either going to 10th group or to third group. Um, mm -hmm. each group is regionally aligned. First group is regional aligned with Asia. Then it's third group that's regionally aligned with, uh, Africa, fifth group, uh, the middle East, seventh group, South America, and 10th group, Europe and Northern Africa. And so, um, my, when it came down, I got, I originally got 10th group, which meant I was going to go to Fort Carson and I chose to give that up for to stay at Fort Bragg. And the reason was this, like, why would you ever do that? Well, my, by this point, by the time I, by, by the time I reached this point, my daughter, my second daughter was born and I didn't want to mm -hmm. bounce my daughters. Cause if I'd gone to Fort Carson, I would have PCS from Fort Bragg to Fort Carson. And then at some point they might have an opening at, in Europe. So that meant I would then PCS again from Europe or from, Fort Carson to Europe. And then at some point I have to go be an instructor. So then now I'm bringing my kids right back to Fort Bragg where they were born. So I was like, mm -hmm. why don't I just stay here, raise my kids here and call it good. I can get somebody to switch with me before I even open my mouth. And sure enough, I walk outside the, the cadre. He was like, if you can find somebody to swap with you, I don't care. So I, as I was walking out of the door, my buddy was walking in and I goes, Hey, what group you want? And he goes, I don't, he goes, I don't want third. I go, you want 10th? And we walked, turned right around and walked within 30 seconds. I had somebody to wow. swap with me. Oh, wow. So I've completed the Q course, went to language school and then SEER school. And SEER school is 
is the one school to this day. This is uh, survival, evasion, resistance, evade. And then here in this school, they teach you how to survive out on your own. They teach you how to resist uh, the enemy while under captivity. They teach you how methods of escape and, uh, and evasion. And so this is where I learned something that I'm seeing actively done today in media. They teach you a lot about propaganda and how mm -hmm. to resist the indoctrination of new principles. And so I see what they're, they teach you the techniques that the enemy uses and everything they're teaching, you're seeing in the media today. Like you're seeing it almost verbatim. Yeah. And it's scary. Yep. So, so now you, you have graduated. Are you a Green Beret now? Yep. I'm a full fledged Green Beret and I go to third group and, um, I was assigned to third, uh, third battalion alpha company, uh, operational detachment at the time it was a three number. Uh, special forces team, except for 10th group had uh, three numbers. Or maybe 10th group, I think 10th group might have had four, but uh, yeah, you, each group had three numbers. Uh, the operation, uh, so the first number denotes what, what company you're in, the second the number would denote what battalion you belong to, and the third number would tell you what type of team. So if someone said, hey, I'm on team one, two, three. I could easily say, all right, that that's a first group team and second battalion, and that's a mobility, a mobility team, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And um, I would be right, like ninety seven cent, ninety nine percent of the time, unless the team was redesignated. The all the threes were redesignated. Um, mm -hmm. So I was on three threes. Uh, I was on three seven two, and then it later became a four digit number, which meant the first digit was the group. The second digit denoted the uh, battalion. The uh, first, the third number denoted the company, and the last number told you what type of team you were on. So, if you were on a four a team that ended with four, I, would, I knew you did military free fall operations. If you were a, a number that ended in five, I knew that you did scuba operations. Mm -hmm. and so forth and so on. So I, I would be able to, like, if I say, hey, what team you're on? And he said, oh, I was on three, one that ended with the two. Oh, you're a mountain team? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we were like a mountain team uh, specializing in uh, mountain warfare. And I had a really cool team sergeant, real cool. Like, our leadership was awesome. Uh, three, 372 was a great team. And then when we came three, three, one, two, that legacy continued on. Um, mm -hmm. we deployed to, to Jordan in 05 or 06. We did a, like a three or four month rotation there. And then, and that's what we were doing, uh, FID operations, which is foreign internal defense operations, where we, uh, take the local military and we train them, their special operators, and we train with them. And we did that, uh, for a few months. And, uh, and then we, after that, we, in 2006, October, 2006, we deployed to Afghanistan. So that was my first deployment. So, so from 9-11, you didn't deploy overseas until 2005? Right. Cause, uh, I took the long route. So I got recycled a few times in the Q course, uh, meaning, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't, I didn't meet the standard and, uh, some of the, courses and I had to repeat it again, which was fine. Mm -hmm. uh, so it took me a little bit longer. And then when you had to repeat, you had to wait until the next class started. So some classes okay. were like six months long, some were three months. So if I, and then if the class started, it just ended up, I had to wait six months to, to get into a, one of the classes. And so once I did, right. I was a, I had to go through the engineer course. So I joined special forces to be a special forces engineer. So now you're, you're, where'd you go in Afghanistan? Are you in Kabul, Bagram? So we flew into Bagram and then we spent a few days in uh, Jalalabad. And those first, 
that first week, I mean, we were, we were ripping out with the seventh group team and it was just back to back mission. We were roll. We, we got on ground, we got our gear, we flew out to uh, Jalalabad, linked up with the team there. And once we hit the ground, we were constantly out, you know, kicking in doors, looking for bad mm -hmm. guys all over the place at Jalalabad. But then uh, we ended up going north up the Kunar Valley into a firebase called Firebase Nuray. And we spent the remainder of our tour there. And so we only spent a week doing all that, but we did even more out in, um, what do you call it, in Kunar. And we, so we were there for seven months, seven or eight months. That's when things got really interesting. You know, there's the Q course prepares you for a lot. I would say I walked out of the Q course prepared to operate on my team mm -hmm. with everything, with almost everything I needed to know. But one of, there's aspects that you're just not ready for and um, is working with, let's say, other agencies and other, other departments within the Departments of Justice and our intel gathering assets that we had to work, mm -hmm. we had to exercise around and work alongside with. And so that was a little bit of a challenge, but we developed some really good relationships with the, uh, with the FBI and uh, with another group of guys that we worked with. We were really close to the, Af to the Afghan Pakistan border. And um, there was only one major road that ran North and South. And we, when it, whenever we went out, everybody else went out with us. If we didn't go out, nobody went out. So it was one of those working dynamics. And plus we had a, like a huge fighting force of Afghans that were just chomping at the bit to get in firefights. And they were some of our, really? yeah, they were some of our best. They were some of the best pro Afghani government soldiers I ever worked with. Um, at the time, we wow. we called them uh, Afghan security uh, security forces, and they weren't mm -hmm. a technical uh, uniform military, but they were all trained by uh, U.S. Special Forces and uh, Marine Corps embedded tactical teams. And once the government began to organize itself, they hired these um, these these the security force to either be law enforcement, border patrol agents, or other aspects of security in and around the area. And that, mm -hmm. that didn't happen until 2008. But to, uh, some of those guys didn't want to do that. They loved being with, they loved working with us, the SF guys. They didn't want to be in the mm -hmm. Afghan military. So they joined, they started the government of the United States, along with its allies, started standing up these specialty units. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of our the work that the, our Afghans did was good enough that um, caught the attention of some other elite guys. And they, uh, I don't even know how to define our ground branch, but um, the ground. Delta. Yeah, Delta. Uh, not, not Delta, but ground branch. Uh, paramilitary units from the CIA, but they caught, got their attention and uh, our Afghan security force went to go work for them. And the reason for that is when the ground branch guys brought in Afghans, they brought them from another part of Afghanistan and the locals mm -hmm. there were like, well, they're just going to take their money and go to wherever they're from and spend it, get them out of here. And you're not going to tell us what to do. So they start throwing rockets at us. We start getting like these little small bases start getting shot at. And so we sat down with the local leaders and like, all right, man, what's going on? And they're like, you got foreigners here, man. They get, get these guys from other parts of Afghanistan out of our neighborhood. And uh, once that dynamic was kind of uh, uh, voiced to us, then we took our Afghan security force, gave them to them. They trained them up, gave them high-speed uniforms and weapons and all sorts of cool guy stuff. 
and they became mm -hmm. um and they left us a small contingent um uh, for our fire base and this is over the span this is between 2006 2007 so i wasn't there for a lot of this for some of this uh -huh. but i was there uh which leads up to the next story i'm gonna tell you about because we had uh i told you about rob uh staff sergeant robert james miller he was uh yep. he was our junior bravo on our team uh he got no what's he, that oh, mean? he was our weapon sergeant our junior weapon sergeant okay. each our an, an operational detachment has 12 guys you, ha you have a captain a master sergeant a warrant officer and an intel sergeant and that's pretty much your leadership cell and then mm -hmm. you have two weapon sergeants, two engineers, two communicators, two medics. And that makes up the other half of the team. The working, the, yeah. I, I call it the working half of the team. Rob Miller was the junior Bravo. Uh, so the working half of the team has a senior and a junior for each MOS. And so he was a junior of the weapons sergeants. Uh, other of the weapons mm -hmm. guys he spoke hey, so when he got to the team he spoke spanish russian and german wow impressive by the time we ended our first trip to afghanistan he picked up urdu and pashto wow that's whoa those are hard languages yes so we got this young kid on our team who is a weapon sergeant dropped out of college joined the army uh, to become a Green Beret, he was a part of the X-ray program. He comes to the team, and there's a little bit of hazing back in the day. There was a little bit of hazing. Nothing like getting greased down, butt naked, and sliding down a hallway like a penguin on ice or anything like that. No, it was like, yeah. hey, new guy, go get the guys. Go get, the, go buy lunch. And then they throw some cash at me, and I go... Hey, new guy, go fill up the beer, you know, fill up the refrigerator with beer. All right, they give me money, I go buy the beer. Hey, new guy, do this. Hey, guy, new guy, do that. So there was a couple of us that were new when we first got to the team. Rob Miller got to the team in 2006. I don't know. I don't remember exactly. And I'm like, so I'm just waiting for the, so for all the senior guys to just eat Robbie's lunch when he walks in. And like they did me, like me and the, the couple of other guys yeah. ever do. He walks in and these guys are like, hey, Rob, welcome to the team. I'm so-and-so, blah, blah, blah. And I'm and me and the other guys were like, yeah, what, what's the difference here? Like, what's, what's going on right now? And I was pissed. Like, I was like, I was kind of sulking around and Rob, uh, the team sergeant was like, hey, Mackie, come over here and uh, introduce yourself to Rob. So I walk on over. I shake his hand. He's like, hey, man. And like, he's like this young kid. Like, he looks like straight off the beach. He's like, mm -hmm. hey, my name is Robbie. My name is uh, Staff Sergeant Miller. You call me Robbie. And he has this nice, just this boyish grin. And he's just like, mm -hmm. and you're like, all right, this guy's all right. You know, he just couldn't help but like yeah. him. He, he, he was a goofball. He, mm -hmm. he, he didn't go through everything that we went through. In fact, shortly after he went there, uh, he got to the team. All the crap that we went through kind of ceased. We were like the last generation on that team that went through that. Um, mm -hmm. And it wasn't bad. And it was, I would go through it again. Anybody could, hey, it was stupid stuff. Um, so we, we finished that. So we, we finished, we deploy together. We do a bunch of stuff together. And Robbie, he, he goes on the first deployment with us and he just kicks ass. We get into the first firefights. He's jumping off his, we, he, he rode an ATV. And he would jump off his ATV and you know, get out, whip out his saw and just start going to town, um, doing his job. He was really good with training. He was really good. saw being a squad automatic yeah, weapon. Yeah, yeah, He would. Uh, he was really instrumental in a training. We were all trained the uh, the Afghan security force, but he was the one that took the extra time to go and eat dinner with them. Go listen, mm -hmm. watch movies with them. And this is how he picked up the language. He would go and eat. Um, when they have weddings, they would invite the team. And Robbie made sure made sure that he dressed. We all had traditional garb. And 
he had hung out with him enough to like, no, you're wearing it wrong. And so he, 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 yeah, he'd built, he'd built up a lot of respect yeah. with those people. Oh yeah. And so he, he was really instrumental in teaching, uh, training them. And then when, um, and he was recognized by the ground branch guys for how well the Afghans were trained. And of course he had a senior there to help guide the way, but yeah, he, mm-hmm. he was definitely one of the guys when everybody else was in their rooms working, um, because to be honest with you, our weapons, our weapons guys, once training is done and weapons are clean, their job is pretty much done. Yeah. The engineers, we're still, we're fixing stuff around the base. Yeah. We're, uh, working with workers. The combo guys are trying to keep comms up. The medics are waiting for someone to get hurt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, the weapons guys usually had the most time on their hands. And so he took advantage of that and made sure he spent that time wisely. And he chose to really integrate himself into the Afghans and, uh, and learn the language, eat the food, everything. Yeah. So that's 2006. And then, to, or, and then there's 2007. So we finish up that that deployment. Not a lot happened. We did a lot of missions with the ground branch guys. Uh, one mission in particular is going to run over until the following year, where mm-hmm. where the story is going to lead off to. We go. So we, there's this there's this valley, really tight valley. So you have. I said earlier there is a one road. Um, and the, that one road ran north and south. So on the west, east side of the road was a river, and that paralleled the road up into this mm-hmm. valley. And the, before it goes up into this valley, the valley splits. It goes off into Pakistan, and then the other half goes into what is no longer Kunar Valley, but now Nuristan. And so Nuristan could be its own separate country in and of itself. Mm-hmm. They speak their own language. They have their own culture. Islam is predominantly uh, the, the predominant religion, but there's other religions in the area. But heading up into what well, we called it Ambush Alley, which is really tight valley. When I mean tight, mm-hmm. the mountains were steep. They sloped down to the bottom to the base of the of the valley or can you might as well just call it a canyon and then you had the river and the road and that's it and uh we did a mission up and but uh off that road like streets but you can't traverse them on truck or footpaths that go mm-hmm. into these tighter even tighter valleys where afghans lived and coexisted with with no like they were out there by themselves, little small villages. Right. And the only time they, and very few of the villagers had contact with the real world. But there was, that's where the, 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 the shitheads would like to hide out in. They would get into these, these mountain passes, which is essentially a maze. And they knew them. And they, that's how they would infiltrate into other parts of Afghanistan. And so okay. we did a mission up in one of those valleys with the ground branch guys. And this was 2000, the winter of 2006 or seven, that time frame, January. And we were going mm-hmm. after a IED financier. And if we were to take him out, either apprehend him or kill him, we could stem the flow of cash for a brief period of time until that vacuum is filled. So we went after this guy. We got really close to closing in on him, but the mission got kinked before we can kick any doors. And so I'm going to put a pin in that. So that was a bust. We did some more missions after that with the ground branch guys. And then we, we kind of go back home. We go, not kind of, we go back home and uh, we refit, we get new leadership. We do some more training. Robbie goes off to ranger school. A lot of us goes off, go off to other schools and then, uh, 2007 2008 rolls around and that october we're back in afghanistan and this time it's 372 you're going home and you guys are oh, yeah. coming back yeah so we go home we're home maybe six months 
So mm-hmm. we get home July, um, May, and we get we're, yeah we're home four or five months, and then we, we're back in Afghanistan for another eight month trip, and um, things are different. Things are obviously different. Uh, the area is still relatively quiet, um, but the atmosphere was just different. And so mm-hmm. we're going, we're going, we're we're getting out, and we're getting out to these remote villages, and we're talking with the people. Uh, we get as far north as this village called Barj Matal, Bar Barji Matal. And it's a uh, Nuristani village, and that's where we 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 decided we were going to bring out some medical assets and do some uh, intel gathering um, using those medical assets. Uh, where we what we'll do is set up these me- uh, what we call a med cap, and mm-hmm. when this med cap is coming, it comes in. One of us is triaging the patients. Uh, the the uh, somebody would come in and say a phrase to us, and then get kind of carted off in a different direction. And right. that's where they would start um, relaying information to somebody else on the team. Yeah, Intel guy. Yep. And uh, so that happened, and we had all these. As, we had all these uh, medical assets, like these real, like doctors and vets and whatnot, and we had them bring in their horses and their sheep and their their uh, their goats and whatnot. And uh, the vet provided medicine and treated the uh, the animals. And then we got invited to play Buscat, Buscacci, which is a polo game played on horse yeah. with the uh-huh. goat carcass. And, um, I was, I was, a, I, I was, I'm always been a big dude. I'm like six, three, 250, 60 pounds back in that time mm-hmm. period. I, I said I was 260, 60 pounds of twisted steel and sex appeal, you know, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> does your wife laugh when you say that? Oh, she rolls her eyes <laughs> and then, then, then she gives me the wink. Hey, big boy. All right. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so. <laughs> she uh, so they were like hey let's play buscacci winner takes all all right what's all that uh, you have to buy us a real goat if we win you buy us a real goat if you if we lose we buy you a real goat and we'll all feast and eat and they're like all right cool mm-hmm. well uh all we're all big dudes and we're like I try to get on the horse and the horse just was like, Nope, not having it. So, so Robbie, <laughs> uh, I have to share this picture with you uh, one day. Uh, so Robbie gets on the horse and I'm like, I've always been kind of like a photographer. And so I carry a camera with me all the time, especially when I was deployed. Uh, mm-hmm. and so I capture this picture of Robbie on horseback. And uh, if you ever look him up, it's one of the pictures you'll find. Um, and that's a picture I took and it's my favorite picture that I've ever took. Uh, so, so Robbie plays Buscacci, we lose. And, um, I end up buying a goat for the village and we end up having a small feast with it. So it was, it was a pretty neat experience, but, uh, so we head back and, uh, we, the, so that was December. Dang it. Do it again. Uh, so now it's January 24th, 23rd, 24th. Our Intel guys are ginning up this mission. We've done this mission before partially. We kind of knew what we were getting ourselves into. And mm-hmm. the ground branch guys said, we can't do it. So my captain's like, screw it. We're going to do it. We're going to execute it ourselves. We're going to use the Afghan army. And this should be an easy enough job for us to do. If the Afghans can't do it, we'll do it. So we roll up to this, to the little place that we were going and we have assets on station. So what I mean by that is we have aircraft on station that serves Mm -hmm. various functions 
and we find out that the target that we're going after isn't in the place where we had previously gone a year before. That's the spot where I was telling you we went prior. Uh, but he's still in the area, but he's on the other side of the of the river. All right, good enough. Um, some things happened on the way there. Uh, something the Afghans rarely do is block the road. And so when we were going through the ambush alley on that road next to the river in the deep valley, there was a huge boulder and I had to blow it up to get past mm -hmm. it. And then we continue on and we go up these switchbacks and then it opens up into this plateau. Now there's mountains on our backside and the backstop on the other side of the river is some compounds where the target is and another in Pakistan and mountains lead into Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So something that you rarely do, and I don't think rarely like happens too often in the army is the army, the, our U S army, we set up an ambush and we ambushed the guys coming out of the, um, and that's like the full on, we opened up with rockets and we opened up with, uh, with our small arms and machine guns and did our mm -hmm. mad minute. And then we went over to do the rest of the priorities of work, um, to, to, to assess what's going on. The only problem is we didn't do a speedy withdrawal. Uh, but we'd, you know, we executed pretty much a textbook uh, ambush for the most part. But uh, after we had shot all these ro rockets and shot all these weapons at for a good, it was a long period of time. Uh, mm -hmm. We had to do a battle damage assessment. And uh, so the captain said, all right, hey, Mackie, Miller, and a couple other guys come along, you know, uh, you're going to come with us on the other side of the river. So we, Rob and I are starting to, you know, throw mags in our, you know, replenish what we shot, uh, make sure we had mm -hmm. grenades and everything. We get our Afghans and Robbie Miller takes charge of the Afghans and uh, speaking their language and everything. And he leads them. He's leading out front with them. Afghans are in front. Robbie's in the back. Then there's me, our Air Force guy, and then the rest of the team with some more Afghans. And we, we have to, in order to get across the river, we have to go up to a bridge and then come back down. So we had to go up north, maybe like a couple hundred meters, and then come back down. And, um, and it's still dark outside. The moon is out. And now the mountain, as we're heading south, the mountain there's a mountain that you can just lean over and touch with your left hand. It's a few feet mm -hmm. away from me. But as we get closer to where we conducted the ambush, where we were shooting into, it spreads out onto like a little plateau. So you have some low ground to the right. You have the river to the right that runs north and south. And you still have this mountain range, uh, ridge line that's uh, walk. It, it go, it's descending down in the direction that we're walking but we're walking on flat ground and mm -hmm. this is where we start hitting snow uh, uh, because there was it's like we start hitting snow so we were walking on snow walking down this trail and it kind of opens up and we're in a file because it's such a narrow path as like i said it opens up and at the back side of that open field was a boulder and the the draw, the, the ridge line that was off to my left goes down. That's where it stopped. And then there's another mountain. There's the boulder. And where the, the ridge line stops, there's like a path that cuts behind it. So it's like, it's like a, a nice channelized escape route. And it's masked mm -hmm. on the other side by some high ground. Right. Um, so what we didn't know was that there was dudes on that ridge line waiting for us. There was guys, there was a brick by this point as the field opened up, there was a rock wall about hip high um, off to my right, my left, excuse me. And the, the, uh, because the river was on low ground, 
the rest of the field to my right was terraced. So it was like flat, then it comes to a wall, then it drops, then it's flat. So it looked like a staircase going to the river. Right. So we're walking along this path. It opens up and the Afghans are up front and they're, they're the closest to where that boulder is. And you hear, you hear one, you hear someone pop up from behind that, uh, that boulder and scream Alawa Akbar. And then you just see everything light up. He's shooting and his gun jams. And then Robbie, the Afghans take off running and Robbie, he takes that, squad automatic weapon the 249 he just puts it into action and he dumps a few rounds in that guy and he turns um and now this time bullets are flying like we because he was up front it was kind of hard to tell what was going on but now bullets are flying in my direction and i get hit in the the magazine on my chest plate and mm -hmm. my captain gets hit and this is when like everything just starts to go into slow motion. Uh, when this happens, one of the assets turns on this invisible beam that we can see with our night vision goggles that you can't mm -hmm. see with the naked eye. And we see that there's target, there's guys off to our left behind that wall and up on the ridge line, and we start shooting at them. And you know we're killing, you know we're we're shooting guys. And they're getting injured, and um, so there's a good chance some of them dying. But Robbie, you know, there's times where I go to shoot somebody, and Robbie's already got it done because he has that. He's just right. He's right there in the thick of it. Uh, the mm -hmm. part of the element I was in was in the actual kill zone, so we got RPGs and whatnot raining in on us, and all hell broke loose. The captain's hit, and. At this time, it's like I, I get hit again. Or, no, I don't get hit again. Um, Rob, while he's doing everything he's doing, at some point he yells, break contact. And because we're still in this file, I'm waiting. Uh, I, I'm the next person behind him. I step to my left. The Air Force guy steps to the right, so forth and so on. So we're doing like this herringbone thing, and we're kind of like throwing mm -hmm. down supporting fire. Uh, in one direction and I, our SOP was for Rob to run down the center of where everybody's left and right. And then my, when he, when he passes me, what's supposed to happen is, you know, I shoot in the direction in which that he was breaking contact from on full auto and then break contact. And we start peeling back that way. Well, right. he said break contact and that never happened. He he let off his belt and that was it. I I didn't hear him say moving. I didn't hear him say anything. So I look over to where he was. He was kind of off to the right, um, and I see him on his back. And I I say, "Hey, Rob's hit." And so I'm still engaging targets and moving over to his location and um, going against our SOPs because we're supposed to fight in place. He's, he's supposed to do self buddy aid, get him, you know, return fire, do self, self aid, and then get behind cover. But he was in no position to move. Um, and so I ran to get him aid until somebody can come and assist me. And that, that somebody was the Air Force guy. Um, mm -hmm. So I got my Air Force JTAC, who's a joint terminal air, air controller, and myself uh, work, you know, covering fire. I'm looking for wounds on him while uh, the JTAC is uh, laying down suppressive fire for me. I can't find anything. And I was like, all right, let's get him to, let's get him to a safe place. And um, while I was doing all that, he dies in my arms. <sighs> and um, so now I'm stuck, like I'm stuck in the middle of, in the open. We're taking a lot of gunfire. I got the I got the most important asset sitting next to me, and we're in a predicament that's hard to get out of. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I say to him, I go, "Hey, dude, we got to break contact." And he's like, "We're not leaving without Rob." I'm like, "Hey, dude, we'll get some bombs on our location. 
will call in danger call in danger close when those bombs are done dropping we'll move for dang it did it again we'll move from um we'll move move from where we're at and move back to where everybody else is and he was like all right mm-hmm. solid plan so he calls in and at this point there was something wrong with his radio equipment, like not his radio equipment, but his range finding equipment. So he was doing like, he's got a map, a compass, pen and paper and a protractor, a map protractor. And Rob Gucci, uh, Rob Gutierrez, the, uh, the JTAC is doing everything analog, no digital equipment. And digital equipment, all he has to do is laser laser range find it. It puts it into the uh, dagger, spits out the nine line. He he calls it up to the aircraft, gives his initials. They drop a bomb. No, he has to do mm-hmm. all the the calculating distance and everything. Guesstimation, the old fashioned way. Yeah, guesstimation. Yeah. And so when it up, and so he he got uh, rounds on target. And, uh, you know, they, they call this a contact tally target. The aircraft sees the target and it, it is acquiring. It is going to go as soon as, uh, uh, as soon as the JTAC says clear hot, you know, the first aircraft dash one cleared hot rounds down. And that's what happened. And, you know, this was the A-10 with the, uh, with the the big the big uh, brrr, gun, yeah. and it's raining milk jugs on us, you know, just these huge bullets, and I can feel the sparks raining down on us. I'm covering Robbie, and he was like, "All right, dash two, contact tally target, cleared hot, boom, next gun run," and then he, he's just laying waste to this ridge line that led down to that where that boulder is, mm-hmm. and then uh, we try during that time period we try to move Rob and we're moving them. We're putting them on our shoulders. And we're, the thing is there's rocks and these rocks just created a, another hazard for us because we we're twisting our ankles and falling all over them because there was snow on top of them. They were slippery. It was just like a huge mess. Mm-hmm. So I said, listen, dude, we're not going to get Robbie back. We're going to leave him here. You're going to hop. We're both going to hop over this wall. We're gonna lay down some suppressive fire. We're gonna lay as much. We're gonna we're gonna go bingo or uh, jackpot on these A tens, and we're gonna have some more A tens come in. We're just gonna keep dropping. He was like, "All right, Roger, I, I got to get back to." Um, and it was during this time period we're having this discussion and moving Robbie. I get shot the second time, and this time it mm-hmm. hits my push to talk. Uh, button that's connected to my headphones and I, I was like the whole time saying hey re uh letting the team know what's going on and nobody's responding and i thought they were like i honestly thought they were all right mackie has it the captain's hurt we're handling it here we'll get to you no i had no comms at all none mm-hmm. zero zilch and I didn't know, like, I didn't, like, I, I felt the impact. I was still breathing. I wasn't hurt. I was still in the game. And that was my focus of staying in the game. Did you have steel plates in your vest? Uh, yeah, we had, like, what they call level three uh, ceramic yeah. plates. Ceramic plates, yeah. yeah. And so I, uh, I made the call. And I was like, I'm going to rob, continue to drop bombs. I'm going to let them know because obviously they're not something's wrong. So I get back. Mm -hmm. Everybody's pulling security around the captain. um, And I go, they're like, Hey, what's what happened? You know, I'm like, I told you what happened over the radio. And then my team sergeant looks at me. He was like, dude, what happened to your magazine and your push to talk? I go, Oh, I'm shot. I got shot. He goes, what? Like that was his reaction. What? He's like, mm-hmm. and this really pissed me off because the next thing I said was Robbie's dead. And this is not a joke. I got a captain who's turning blue. Robbie's dead. I got shot twice. Who knows how many times the JTAC has gotten shot um, and is still out there doing stuff. And you're laughing at me. I didn't need that right now. And 
uh, and I was pissed. Like I was, I was, I don't, I don't think anybody listening to this will understand or understand the gravity of knowing what just happened. Like mm-hmm. it's hard to process, and it was really hard for me to process, especially as yeah, bull- you need, especially as bullets are zipping past you. Yeah, if you've been in a firefight, you can you can you can kind of picture it in your mind. Um, but but please go on. Yeah, and so we we get the so they get the nine line. At this point, psychologically, I'm done. Like I'm I by this point, I think like four or five, maybe six hours have passed. We've been out there all day. My mouth is dry. Mm-hmm. Everybody else's mouth is dry. The JTAC is down, getting shot at. We're getting taken fire. The Afghans, who knows where they're at? Um, the the team, the rest of the team that was on the other side of the uh, the the river, can't shoot to support us because they would have potentially hit us because we got this mountain mm-hmm. here that's a backstop. So we have all these factors against us, and finally, uh, the warrant officer is like, "All right." We're going to call in a medevac. We're going to get Mackie and the captain. Mackie, you're going to take the captain back. Get us a, a speedball, which is a resupply bundle, and get back on the bird and come back out. All right, Roger. So they called in the nine line medevac. A few minutes later, bird comes in, lands. Me and the captain get on board. I take him back to the uh, field surgical tent. The field surgical team's there, and they start working on him. I run to, I run to the uh, the compound to grab this two hundred and fifty pound speedball that's in the duffel bag, and it's like it's like carrying another dead body. And it's like water bottles, chow, grenades. Mm-hmm. Um, and I hear the helicopter. There's like a specific sound that the helicopter makes as it's getting ready to take off. And I'm like, oh, no, it's getting ready to take off. And I'm dragging. I got this thing on my shoulder. And I'm barely, you know, I'm taking all these little baby steps trying to get out to the, and the bird takes off. And I was like, and I sat there on the on the HLZ. And I'm like, WTF, man. Like, what happened now? And then um, mm-hmm. at this time, I'm assessing my equipment. And I'm like, I should get another push to talk. And I said, screw it. Took the the mic off, threw it down. And I was trying to listen in to see us, you know, uh, get in on the air freak and find out what happened. And when I did, I found out that the, uh, that the team, uh, went to go recover Rob's body and they took some more casualties. And the whole time I had this, I just let the team down. They don't have ammo. They don't, they're running low on ammo, food and water. Yeah, and they're in the middle of a firefight. And so, and I'm like, like, how in the hell, I can barely get this bag, this 250-pound bag from the compound 150 meters to the helipad. I'm a, if I fly in, I'm going to fly in on a hot L- HLZ, and I mm-hmm. have this heavy bag. And I, so I started formulating this plan. What we'll do is I have the helicopter fly over the guys and – Behind them, I have them drop the bag and then land and land, you know, put me down on the ground and then I go help out. And that was what I had in my hand. So I, while they, they were doing that, I went to go let the captain know what was going on, but he was out of it. Um, they were uh, putting in a chest tube on him, so there was no talking to him. And I sat there on that duffel bag until the helicopters came back in. And when they did, my team sergeant and three other guys or two other guys got off the bird and they were hurt. And um, the Afghans that went to go work with the ground branch guys have been monitoring the whole event on their ICOM chatter. And they were waiting Mm -hmm. for a green light to go and launch out of their base, which was not far. They were closer to us than the base we were operating from. And so when that second attack happened, they jumped, they had literally took vehicles that didn't belong to them and weapons and jumped in because they heard Robbie was hurt. And they ran, they drove down the road, went through all that ambush 
and got to the area and helped QRF, our team, out of that situation. They helped recover Robbie's body, and they helped uh, um, the team exfil from that um, situation. At the end of the QRF being quick re reaction force. Yeah. So when it was all said and done, they said we there was – I'm gonna be generous and say there was 25 KIA enemy KIA and four times four or five times that wounded. I think those numbers are a little low for the KIA, but I'm gonna go roll with that because I don't want to over exaggerate um, mm -hmm. with one um, US KIA and maybe three or four injuries. So. And, not, and only one, uh, and none of those injuries were, um, were, they were all Purple Heart worthy, but none of them were, um, what do you call it, uh, life threatening. And so, yeah. Uh, so yeah, that, so uh, the team gets back, the mission's over, the, the, our, our, uh, the branch, ground branch, Vipers, that's what they're called. Uh, QRF helped save the day. They were the really, they were, they, they were, they played a major role in QRF and the team. And we roll back, everybody rolls back to the base and um, kind of reflect on what's happening. They come back with Rob's body and um, they gave us about two or three hours to say our last goodbyes to Rob. And, um, that was a real somber event. Um, we, mm. um, the hardest thing in the world was carrying his body step by step to, to the helicopter. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And that's, that, that was, and then shortly after the, so that was January and then April of that, same year we had the battle of shock valley and we had an entire uh special forces team minus two guys all re you know they all were recipients of the silver star and then mm -hmm. uh a couple of my guys i was qrf for that battle uh, i didn't get to go on the ground but uh the team most of my team was there and they uh all walked away with valorous awards for that um, particular uh, firefight. And that pretty much closed out 08. And then, um, but yeah. And so I came back from that 08 trip really distraught. I was in a different place. Um, I hadn't quite processed Rob's death all the way. Mm -hmm. And um, we ended up... Uh, we ended up, uh, third special forces group ended up standing up the, what they call the special operations, multi-purpose canine unit. And what this was were special forces guys who will be trained to handle a canine that will find IEDs and track down bad guys. Mm-hmm. And I, in my head now, I'm thinking, I'm formulating in my head, well, if I do this, this will give me, because the team was slotted to deploy again. So that was a, uh, April. So they, we returned back in May. So we were slotted to deploy again in October, I believe, of 09. And I said to myself, you know, I need a break. I'm a volunteer for this canine unit. It's going to take me two months to train. And then I have to come back and certify my dog. That can take two months. And then there's family time and this and that. I'll miss this next deployment, take a break, call it good. And, and then catch the one in 2010. Mm -hmm. So I get, I volunteer to do the dog program. I get to uh, get my dog, come back, we certify. And then the, 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 the team sergeant looks at me and says, you're deploying. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. I only been back home for four months and none of that was spent with my family. 
Mm. All of that was done. I was doing nothing but dog training and during the certification. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. And he was like, no, yeah, I need you to deploy. You're, we're, this is a, this is new and the teams need them right now. So I'm like, all right, Roger. So where, where did you train the dog at? Where was that so, conducted? So we, the training was done out of Peru, Indiana and, um, in a place called, uh, Von Lick Kennels. And, uh, we, that's where we got our dog. That's where we learned how to do everything we needed to do for, um, uh, IED counter IED and, mm -hmm. um, uh, what we call sensitive site exploitation, um, mm -hmm. looking for IED making, you know, type materials, right. uh, per se, um, not like batteries or anything like that, but anything that's explosive related, we were, that's what we were trained to look for. Hey players, that's the end of part two. And guess what? Part three comes out tomorrow. I know having three parts is a little unusual, but our guest has some great and compelling stories. In the meantime, just a reminder that Game of Crimes is now posting interview videos on YouTube. You can find those at Game of Crimes podcast. And I ask that you click on subscribe and like buttons. On social media, check us out on Facebook and Instagram at Game of Crimes Podcast and on X at Game of Crimes. Also on Facebook, type in Game of Crimes fan page and join us for some fun there. Our website is GameofCrimesPodcast.com. We've got a lot more information there, including all our episodes, the book list, uh, Game of Crimes merchandise, and more. And for more content, join us on Patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. I have several monthly episodes that range from silly to serious, so come on over and join the fun. In the meantime, everyone stay safe. We'll see you tomorrow for part three.